The following is a hoop ball presentation. Welcome to the Fantasy NBA Today podcast. Good day, friends. It's Fantasy NBA Today. Good day, everyone. A pleasant Tuesday. I don't know, man. I just thought I'd get weird to start the show. What's happening? Uh, I am Dan Baspris. This is Fantasy NBA Today, a hoop ball presentation. It's Tuesday. We had a big Monday card. We got some storylines to cover. We're not doing the box score stuff anymore. Remember, we're not going through every single game. We're just going to pick out, pick and choose the stuff that we like the most. It's election day, also an important thing. It's a four-game Tuesday card, a light Tuesday card. We've also got Joe Garcia of the Two Shots podcast to talk to us about the San Antonio Spurs on today's show. That's coming up in just a little bit as well. So another fun one on the way here from your good pals at Hoopball. I am at Dan Bespris on Twitter. If you'd like to give me a follow, it's been a fun time. I want to take another moment here at the beginning of the show to thank everybody who has been uh, responding and helping kind of spread the Dan Bespris tweet storms. I know I mentioned it on yesterday's podcast, but I feel like at this point I should mention it every day that people seem to like it. You guys have been incredible. I know you're like, Dan, you're the one putting out the tweet storms, but it's really cool for me. So here's the thing. Let's go behind the curtain here on Dan Bespris a little bit. Uh, I never in my wildest dreams thought that I would become... Some someone that people cared about on Twitter, and it's not like I'm I'm degrading myself here. I just I never really fully understood how it worked, and I just started doing it. And let this be a lesson to all of us, I guess. Uh, if you don't understand something, just keep doing it until you understand it, and that's where I am. I think with Twitter, I'm still I'm sure messing some stuff up that I could be doing better, but it seems like a lot of you really enjoy those tweet storms. I just thought I'd do it. A, a couple weeks ago to get my thoughts down on paper. Uh, and then you guys started retweeting it and replying to it and liking it and all and interacting with it. And it became really fun to talk to everybody at the end of the night about the games that just happened. So I'm going to keep doing it. It seems like some of you are actually finding this podcast because you found my tweet storms. And that's super cool for me because this is my baby. This podcast, this is... Okay, Asher is my baby, but this is my other one. Okay, my dog Gumshoe is also sort of my baby, but this is my other one. My podcast is my third baby, and when I get to see it grow, when I get to see more of you find it, however you find me or the show, it makes me so happy. Uh, and so thank you for continuing to follow the, the podcast, and thank you for following me on Twitter, and thanks for spreading the word. And honestly, the only thing I ask of you is... All of this stuff, the tweet storms, the podcast, whatever, this is all just going to be me jamming out thoughts all the time, and it's all going to be free. The only thing I ask, really, is to help keep helping me spread the word, whether it's about the tweet storms or the show or both, and I'll be grateful to you forever. And whether that's a retweet or whether that's a share or whatever it is that you could do on social media or even just like finding somebody in your friend circle and you're talking about sports and you're like, hey, if you guys seen Dan or listen to Fantasy NBA Today, I will love you forever. And feel free to let me know you did it, too. I'll, I'll give you a big electronic kiss. It'll be a wet one, too. Uh, first things first. I want to talk about the Monday games. Then we'll talk to Joe, and then we'll get set for the Tuesday evening, the light card. Uh, Storylines from Monday, and there were a handful of them on a nine-game night. It's basically unavoidable. I will tell you right out of the shoot, there were also a couple of games that were completely uninteresting, but there weren't that many that were completely uninteresting. So a pretty fun night, all things considered. Houston, Indiana, I would say was almost an uninteresting game, but I will say that Tyreek Evans is actually the guy in Indiana that, to me, is closer to the chopping block. We had so many questions the first week of the season about what to do with Darren Collison, and admittedly, he, he again had kind of a quiet ball game in this one. Collison is Collison. When he has a quiet one, it's going to be really quiet because he's not a high-usage point guard. He's on a on the average night, you want like 12, 
and five and a steal and one and a half three point or one three pointer, let's say, and low turnovers and a really high field goal percent for a point guard and a good free throw number. And by all accounts, he's actually on his way to that this year. He's sh- his shooting is down. His free throw is way down, and that's gonna that's gonna level off at some point this year. He's shooting only seventy four percent at the foul line. He's never had a season under 79, and that was, I think, half of a season in Sacramento, so that probably would have leveled off at some point. He's never played an entire NBA season and shot lower than 83, so that'll come back up, and his value is going to move with it. The 47.2% from the field, it's possible that that holds, but I wouldn't bank on it because he's actually attempting fewer three-pointers this year and shooting way worse from downtown than any season in his entire NBA career. So a lot of this stuff for Collison is going to level off. Otherwise, things are actually fine. If the shooting levels off, his 9.5 points likely likely comes up to about 11, which is a little bit down from last year, but not by any extraordinary amount. The 2 and change rebounds will likely be unchanged. The 4 to 5 assists is basically what you're expecting from him. A perfect world would be a little over 5. And he's at 1.5 steals right now, which is actually tying his career best mark. So all these little things that are going to level off, I was never super worried about Collison. I am worried about Tyreek Evans because after a couple of good games where people started to freak out that he was pushing Collison out of the rotation, he has been getting pushed out of the rotation and hasn't eclipsed 22 minutes since October 24th. He's now averaging under 20 minutes a game on the year, and he's sitting outside the top 160. Here's the two things on Tyreek Evans. One, he's a stat magnet. He is a stat magnet. If he can get into the 20 to 24 range in minutes, and it doesn't take much to get him there, he can climb from the 160 range to the 125 range. So there is reason for hope. But it doesn't look like he's going to get anywhere near the 30 minutes that he played in Memphis, and it doesn't look like he's going to get anywhere near even mid to high 20s at some point this season. And so with that in mind, he's a guy that does have a ton of upside, right? We're always chasing upside. But unless someone gets hurt in Indiana, and I would think it would have to be uh, Bogdanovich or Collison uh, or Oladipo, there's no real path to more than 23 minutes for Tyreek Evans. So if you're holding him at this point, it's likely on your bench. You treat him like a stash, and you treat him almost like a handcuff, but I'm getting pretty close to kicking him to the curb for somebody who's actually out there, who can do some stuff, who's playing enough to make a significant impact on the basketball game, and it's just not him. Meanwhile, uh, our good pal Thaddeus Young is ever so slowly working his way back to his normal spot. Uh, he, he's had a weird couple of games that's kind of dragging him down after he had that one big game. This is the up and the down with a guy who sort of plods along the way he has and never misses a game. He played through a flu and had 8-11 and 11 in yesterday's ball game. He's averaging 1.4 steals, so things are not that far off from where they need to be, uh, much like Collison. You know, a little bit here and there, and everything turns on its head. Demontis Sabonis right now is the guy that's sort of chewing up the extra stuff in Indiana with crazy percentages. Crazy percentages that don't feel sustainable. He's shooting 68% from the field, 81% at the foul line, which is possible. He's got a pretty feathery touch, so maybe the free throw number does come up a little bit. Uh, But in fewer minutes than last year, his rebounds are up one, his scoring's up two and a half, steals and blocks are both pretty low, but they are up season over season. He even made a three-pointer in one of those games just for good measure. So while he's a guy that you should be using right now while he's playing well, he's also a guy that's going to slowly settle back in. He's not going to have 17 and 9 every night off the bench. He's also not going to crush poor Miles Turner every day. But as long as he's playing well, they're going to ride him, and he looks like he's said to have a better season than, I know, me personally. I didn't expect him to be a top 50 guy at this point in the year or any point in the year, but I do think that he will settle back down a little bit. He's, to me, a bit of a sell-high guy, but I don't know if people in your league are actually going to believe that this is a sustainable thing. You're going to have to convince them. 
Uh, Cleveland Orlando. This is a game that we put on our uh, our homework assignment list on yesterday's podcast, and I guess what we learned here is that Tristan Thompson is going to get a whole bunch of minutes. Larry Nance Jr. to me is a guy you can probably cut. They're not playing him enough. This was Sam Decker turned his ankle, and Nance still didn't get any more minutes. They're trotting out the big man. Tristan Thompson, he of almost no offensive game, somehow find his way to 19 points against the Magic yesterday. But uh, looks like he could get you 10 rebounds a night. And there's a usefulness for that. Certainly more so, I think, in a Roto League. You drop him in there in a good matchup and give yourself a little rebounding boost. No, I don't trust George Hill or J.R. Smith or Jordan Clarkson or Rodney Hood. Chetty Osman played 43 minutes in this overtime game. His shot selection is atrocious, but he's going to go through cold spells and then he'll go through warm spells and you just want to be there when the good stuff happens. But damn, he's having a rough go from the field right now. I don't think you can drop Osman. He's probably the one guy on this team that I don't think you can drop because he's going to log a ton of minutes and take a ton of shots. And you just hope that at some point he starts making like 43% of them because then he can be fairly useful. As of right now, this shooting slump, he's killing you. Terrence Ross, I mentioned him on Twitter as a potential streaming option with Jonathan, uh, Jonathan Isaac, I should say, not Jonathan Grant. Jonathan Isaac on the shelf, but that's really the only thing uh, from that Magic side. Nothing out of the Detroit side. For Miami, we were keeping an eye on what would be taking place at the center position with Hassan Whiteside out and it was, not unexpectedly, Bam Adebayo and Kelly Olynyk each logging solid games. Olynyk, if he makes one or two more of his 10 shots, then he really has a big night. Ended up with 13, 5, and 4, a steal, a block, and three three-pointers. I mean, you're looking at a guy that could have ended, ended with like a 16 or an 18-point game, and then people would have been going crazy for him. He and Adebayo are both u- worth using uh, when Whiteside is on the shelf, although bear in mind... They needed more out of bio than usual because the Pistons have Andre Drummond. So they need somebody that could try to push him out a little bit. It didn't work. Drummond had 24 rebounds in this game. Uh, but it worked enough because Miami ended up winning in, uh, in overtime. Richardson, he's hot right now. No, nothing to see there. Justice Winslow, we've got some questions about him lately. I don't really trust him as far as I can throw him. Plus, his percentages are terrible. But he does do a little bit of that kind of Draymond Greeny uh, rebounds, assists, steals, uh, three or two, just doesn't do it on particularly efficient numbers. I think the real, what you're really looking at here is how long can you ride the big men? We don't know. There's been no real update on Whiteside after being ruled out of yesterday's game. The hope is that he's back soon. But if he isn't, well, then feel free to throw these guys into the mix. They're going to be putting up big-time games when Hassan is on the shelf. Simple as that. They're your classic streaming options. But sometimes you're like, well, is this guy actually a good streaming option? Those guys are like guaranteed beautiful streaming options. We are watching the New York Knicks as well. That was one of the teams that I wanted to keep uh, one eye on, a side eye with their new lineups. And in this one, Mitchell Robinson got himself into foul trouble. And Ennis Kanter played 41 minutes in a double overtime game and went 20-20. He and Drummond both. Nice to see Kanter get rolling. Uh, Alonzo Trier played 42 minutes. Damian Dodson, 41. This Knicks team is weird. Noah Vonley finally stayed out of foul trouble. He had a double-double. Kevin Knox came back, played five first-half minutes, got a steal and a dunk, and that was it. He didn't play in the second half. However, however, this Knicks team, clearly, they want to try going younger early. By the way, I'm not worried about Tim Hardaway Jr. Sounds like he was pretty close to playing so I would expect him back for their next ball game. I'm confident enough to say that. But, I mean, listen to these numbers. And again, this is a double overtime, so a lot of these guys you can shave 10 minutes off of their count. But uh, Trier, 42. Dotson, 41. Vonley, 34. Moutier, 34. Hazonia, 36. There are a ton of minutes available for Kevin Knox who I've said on this podcast, I don't much care for his fantasy stat set. He looks like a, a, a rangy, he's tall and lean, which seems like he's more of a small forward right now, but I'm sure in the modern NBA, he'll see a decent number of minutes at power forward, not at center. Uh, 
his stat set looks like it's mostly points and rebounds and threes. But if he's out there, and this is sort of the Chetty Osman theory as well, if the Knicks really are going young, he's going to be a guy that gets into the game and just starts chucking. You know, you could see him in a standard game taking 12, 13 shots a night. And even if he's only hitting 40 to 43% of those on any given season or week or month or whatever it is, you're still talking about a guy that could easily average in the mid-teens in scoring. And there's a place for that in fantasy. So depending on your league settings, I do think that picking up Kevin Knox is not the worst idea in the world. You're going to have to sit on him here while they ramp him back into shape. But I think you're looking at a guy who's going to eventually be in a 24 to 29 minute role. He's going to get a ton of looks when he's on the floor because that's what they're trying to do. And I actually don't mind if he comes off the bench because the bench needs scoring guys. So get in there and just fire away. Play with Ennis Cantor and just take all the shots, the two of you. Uh, And I'm totally cool with that. Is he a must stash player? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. But for instance, I'm in uh, one league, an 11 category league, which is dumb, but I'm in it, that values scoring a little bit more. Field goals made and free throws made are the additional categories. And so I'm picking him up in that one because I think there's a chance that, you know, anybody that's going to take 13, 14 shots a game, and I think that's a possibility for him, should be on a team in a league like that. The upside in scoring outweighs the disappointment in some of the other categories. If you're in a traditional nine-category league, I don't think that'd touch him. I'm not that interested in what I think he's going to bring to the table. I think he might end up hurting you more than he helps in certain spots. But he is going to wipe out the value of some of these other guys. Uh, I think you see Vonley play far fewer minutes. You'll certainly see Hazonia play less minutes going forward. Uh, I think you probably also see some of the guys in the backcourt. And then with Tim Hardaway out, you also saw a boost to some of those guards yesterday as well. Russell Westbrook turned his ankle in that Oklahoma City win over New Orleans, who, by the way, uh, New Orleans suddenly kind of spiraling a little bit, and not quite healthy Anthony Davis is not enough to push that team over the hump. And OKC is starting to play a little bit better, or they were prior to this Westbrook injury. Uh, Westbrook being out means Dennis Schroeder gets another crack at value. So I doubt he's been dropped in any leagues, but if he has... He's a good guy to throw into the mix while Russ is down. Paul George is going to be having more opportunity than he knows what to do with. And Jeremy Grant had another decent ball game, 13 and 6 with two steals and a block. We get we had you pick him up last week and he hasn't done anything to make you drop him so far, so just keep rolling him out there. Boston Denver was a zero fantasy news game. Toronto Utah was basically a zero fantasy news game other than me saying, "Ha ha, Danny Green, I love you so much." This is a back-to-back in altitude, and he still had five cash counters, three steals, a block, and a three-pointer. Nobody salvages a line where they do almost nothing else quite like our good pal, Daniel Green. I didn't mention P.J. Tucker earlier in the show either. Those two guys are rapidly becoming my two favorite fantasy players because nobody owns them, or they didn't, before we started yelling about them. Uh, P.J. Tucker's at 31% ownership, and Danny Green is at... 67 now, but that's because we've been yelling about him for three weeks. Uh, Those two guys are going to average like 0.7 turnovers. That category matters in nine cat leagues. Guys, it, it, and and I'm not going to get an eight cat, nine cat thing. There's, there's value to both sides, but the people that say that punishing someone for turning the ball over is dumb is a little bit short sighted because a guy like Danny green or PJ Tucker, those guys are huge for their teams and they actually have value in a nine-cat league. They should have value. They're good basketball players. I don't know. To me, it just parallels it a little bit for those types of guys. And yes, obviously, it does punish a dude, uh, the ball handlers, but they tend to also do enough in the other categories to kind of outweigh that thing. Uh, I saw Derek Favors get picked up in a few places where he was dropped. I'm not buying it yet. This you know, felt a bit fluky. Ten rebounds for Favors. The little guys just didn't get any rebounds. Uh, if he can find a way to get to those types of marks on a nightly basis, cool, man. But three steals, two blocks, ten boards, that's not happening every night. And he's also not going to make four out of his six shots every night. Just not, to me, he's not involved enough. And with Donovan Mitchell out, everybody had to do a tiny bit more. Minnesota and the Clippers. Uh, Storylines from this ballgame. Boban started and played 18 minutes. 
and he's probably worth starting any time the Clippers go up against a seven-footer on the other team because he'll probably play 18 to 20 minutes in those spots. But Montrez Harrell played the bulk of the center minutes, and that's why he's the better guy to have there. Avery Bradley being out meant more Lou Williams, believe it or not. It didn't really change the fortunes of guys like Pat Beverly or Shea Gilgis-Alexander. I still am hoping that Beverly can carve out some kind of spot, and he was close in yesterday's game with 10-6-4, but no steals, no blocks. Uh, that's what you need out of, out of Pat Bev. But he's closer. He's a guy that I'm never going to stop watching this year from afar. He's not owned in very many leagues these days. So if he starts to show that old Pat Beverly look, then I'll scoop him up and I'll yell at you guys to do the same thing. Meanwhile, the Jimmy Butler saga continues in Minnesota. Uh, Derrick Rose came back, scored 21 points on 20 shots. That's Derrick Rose. He took the most shots on the team by four over Andrew Wiggins, who should definitely not be taking the second most shots on that team. Uh, and, you know, that you just hope that Rose, every time he goes eight for 20, he also has one where he goes 10 for 20 and it balances out. But uh, tough to get a ton of defensive stats from him. He's going to be worth using, though, because with that type of opportunity, you just have to find a place on your roster. I saw people that were like, what if he misses one more game? Should I drop him? Like, well, I mean, that's the Wally Pip phenomenon. If you think he's going to miss a game and then just lose his role with the team, I don't think so. Not under Tibbs. So anyway, I'm plodding along with that one. Josh Okogie was someone we talked about on yesterday's podcast, and he had a tough one. Uh, and we did say that he's a low usage guy, so there are going to be some really rough ones mixed in. I'm a little bit lower on him, I think, than uh, the fantasy community overall. But I'm sure he'll slap it in my face in the next ball game. Kyle Anderson was another storyline we were watching, as was Shelvin Mack in that Memphis Golden State game, and they both were good. Slow mo, four points, four boards, five assists, four steals. That's the line you signed up for. If you picked him up, you didn't expect him to score 10 or more points a game. You don't care if he takes a single shot, frankly, as long as he gets you a handful of rebounds, a handful of assists, and defensive stats. And he did. And Shelvin Mack only played 24 minutes. Some of that was a blowout situation, but had 15 and three with a steal block and two three-pointers again. He's worth using right now. I mean, I'm sure there's going to be a cold spell in there, but if he's really going to play pretty big minutes, then you get him into the mix. You get him into the mix. I think we put him on the pickup list yesterday, tweeted about it over the weekend. Uh, I'm almost certain that he's going to end up back on waiver wires at some point this year, but they love him. He's their backup guard, and he just soaks up Conley's 18 minutes when he's not on the floor, and he soaks up a bunch of minutes when Garrett Temple's not on the floor. He's just their guy at the guard spots. They love him. So if they love him, we should do. We got questions on basically every team, which makes me sound like a pretty bad show host. <laughs> but luckily... There are people out there who can answer those questions on almost every team. And for today, we are thrilled to be joined by Joe Garcia, who covers the San Antonio Spurs. He is the uh, Spurs analyst and a host of the Two Shots podcast. He is a co-host of the Locked on Spurs podcast. You can find him on Twitter at Two Shots Podcast. And the website is two, the number, Shots S A dot com. Uh, the uh, Twitter handle, by the way, is, is spelled out T-W-O. Joe uh, welcome to Fantasy NBA Today. What's up, my man? Oh, nothing, man. Just reveling in a in a great Spurs win last night. I had to stay up late, so I had to drink my coffee this morning so I could do this <laughs> podcast. <laughs> so you'll be happy when Daylight Savings kicks in because the next time they go to Phoenix, the game will be an hour earlier. Oh, yeah, especially, you know, that it goes into effect on Sunday, I believe, at 2, 2 a.m. in the morning, so... An extra hour of sleep is always good for everybody. That's right. Um, so let me start with the broad stuff. The Spurs off to a decent start, which I don't think should surprise anybody, right? It's still LaMarcus Aldridge. It's still Pau Gasol. Still a lot of the familiar names. And most importantly, it's still Greg Popovich. Did people really think this team was going to fall apart? I think a lot of people, especially people in the mainstream media, uh, they picked the Spurs to actually fall apart and you know, just not even be able to contend this early in the season. So I think it's a, a welcome surprise to see how well they're doing with the addition of DeMar DeRozan and how he's fit within the scope of the Spurs system. You know, the Spurs are off to a great start right now. 
Yeah, I, I, I mean, I'm put me on the side of people that said, you know what, I'm not going to doubt Greg Popovich. And plus, on top of everything else, Joe, this is basically the same team they had last year, plus DeMar DeRozan, right? Like Kawhi Leonard played, what was it, nine games last season? So to add an Eastern Conference all-star to a roster that was already pretty decent, and obviously there have been some injuries since then, but... I mean, I feel like everybody just said, oh, they lost Kawhi, but nobody thought about the fact that he didn't play anyway. Yeah, I think that's um, something that people seem to forget about. You know, even with Kawhi not playing, you know, just a handful of games, as you stated, the Spurs were still able to squeak in and get into the playoffs, you know, get into the postseason. Of course, they faced the juggernaut that is the Golden State Warriors. (laughs) But nonetheless, they put up a valiant effort and they were able to squeak out one win instead of getting swept. So they were still a decent enough team, even minus Kawhi Leonard. So I think that goes unspoken a lot, you know, a lot of times, especially for what happened last season and going into this season, like you said, with the additions of DeMar DeRozan and some of the younger players that they have on the on the team. And they, I guess people really didn't know what to expect is what it was. Hmm. Yeah, well, I think people should expect that, that Pop is going to get the most out of his guys. That seems like it's been the case for about uh, two decades, and why would it change to, uh, this season? L- so let me ask you about some of the older guys. That's uh, where we'll start. We'll work our way kind of down the list and get into some of the younger folks. Um, DeRozan is the new addition, and he's looked really comfortable right out of the shoot. I figured he'd be fine this year, but I have to admit, I didn't think it was going to look this easy this soon. How has he been able to fit in so seamlessly? One of his good friends on the team, Rudy Gay. And not only that, but Dwayne Casey also paid a visit to San Antonio in the summertime. You know, when DeMar DeRozan had got word that he was going to be traded, he was in the city trying to get acclimated, still coming to terms with being traded. And he could have, you know, fallen into a depression, uh, you know, and just kind of, you know, had a, a, a glum outlook on what had what had, ins- had aspired before him. Because he didn't expect to be traded from Toronto. But when he came to San Antonio, you know, with his former with his former coach, giving him words of encouragement, telling him he's playing for Coach Pop, one of the better coaches in the NBA. And then with his buddy here, Rudy Gay, I think that transition was kind of seamless. They, they gave him a lot of positivity you know in this <laughs> moment or that you know lapse that he had of you know just wanting to you know be angry you know and he had a right to be but I think he's turned things around and he's been has a very positive outlook on the on the season and it's just showed so much in his game and you know this assist ratio that he has right now with the Spurs and his willingness to share the ball and not only just you know being a prolific scorer he looks like he's having fun it looks like he's just, you know, he's over it. He's moved on, and he's he's been playing great for the Spurs. I mean, you couldn't ask for more from the from a guy who just seemed like a couple of months ago was <laughs> very upset about being traded, and now you look at him and he's happy. It looks like he's found a new home in San Antonio. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. An extremely durable basketball player who's putting up right now career numbers in almost every statistical category. He's at 28 points per game. That would be a career high by one point, but it still counts. Uh, You mentioned the assists and the field goal percent is another one I want to throw in there. Those are way above his previous career highs. Could he potentially keep them that high, or are those maybe going to regress a little bit as the season goes on? I think they're going to still be high, but they're going to regress a little bit as the season wears on because, you know, Pop is going to err on the side of caution, and he's going to dial back the minutes as they get closer and closer to the postseason, you know, it, he's done that. You know, he's notorious for doing that, Coach Pop. So I think as we're entering the the beginning stages of the season, he's going to have, you know, these great minutes, you know, a lot of minutes, because I believe him and uh, LaMarcus Aldridge are one and two as far as minutes played in the NBA right now. Yeah. And that is uncharacteristic of, of a San Antonio Spurs team. <laughs> so you you would see that those minutes will drop off. And with the minutes dropping off, the stats will kind of take a dive a little bit, but not too much. I mean, you can expect to see what you're seeing, you know, maybe minus a couple points here and there. Maybe his stats might take a hit as far as the assists. Field goal percentage might go down a little bit, but it's not going to be drastic. So what you're seeing right now out of him, you might as well just kind of get used to it, I think, as the season unfolds. I dare say that he might even be in the MVP conversation, not that I'm expecting that he's going to win, 
But nonetheless, he's going to be in the conversation. Yeah, he's been incredible so far. Another older guy. It's not fair. You know, I think I'm older than all <laughs> these guys. No, I'm older than all of these guys. But another player that's been in the NBA for a bit that's having a really nice start to the year is Rudy Gay. And this is someone that I think everybody was looking at as, you know, a couple years removed from a big surgery. He rebounded quickly, even, you know, by by almost any standards to have a decent season last year. But he looks really comfortable this season. Gay's points, his scoring is back up from 11 to 14. Uh, the rebounding is way up from 5 to 8. Uh, the steals and blocks have always been kind of a good thing for Gay. He just, he seems so engaged right now. And his minutes, like you said, you know, with DeMar and Aldridge, they're at the top of the list. But Gay is back up to 29 minutes per game, too. Is that, I'm going to sort of ask the same question, is that sustainable? Because... Where with DeRozan, it feels like maybe things have to come back to earth a little bit. With Gay, it doesn't feel like this is all that crazy so far. Yeah, with Gay, I think he's going to kind of stay where he's at right now. And I think it has a lot to do with what happened to him near the course of last season. You know, he kind of was a little disappointed in himself because he said he didn't feel quite like himself until the postseason. And then, as we all know, the Spurs were got knocked out in the first round against Golden State. So he wanted to really show the fans and not only the fans, but the players, what he could really do this season. So he came out with a renewed purpose. And we've seen that not only in the stat sheets, but you can see that he's being a little bit more vocal out there on the court as well with these younger players. You love that, especially with Brent Forbes. I've seen him talk with Brent Forbes, getting them, you know, when they're coming out of the, out of the game together, he's talking with them and and letting them know what he can do to get better. So I love this new Rudy Gay that we're seeing. It's a resurgence of Rudy Gay, you know, and I got to say one thing in particular, Rudy Gay right now is leading the NBA this early in the season and three points and three point percentage shooting, you know, he's (laughs) true right now. He's at 0.643. That's crazy. Yeah, that's an insane number. Okay. So that might come back to earth a little bit. He is hitting 1.3 out of every two, three pointers he's taking, but overall, like you said, he looks really locked in. Uh, The rebounds are a nice sight for a team that, you know, they when Aldridge is the center, they can use another guy out there going and grabbing some boards. Aldridge is probably the one older guy on this team that I'm not all that curious about. He just seems like he's doing the same old thing. So let me ask you, again, talking to uh, Joe Garcia of the Two Shots podcast at Two Shots podcast on Twitter, if you want to give him a follow. Uh, a couple of the younger guys, most notably the one who's on the shelf right now, and that's Derek White, because it seemed like when DeJounte Murray went down, White was in line to be basically the full-time point guard. While he's been out, we've seen some Bryn Forbes. We've seen some Patty Mills. Is this White's job when he comes back, uh, or is he going to find himself in a timeshare? How do you think that is all going to shake out for San Antonio? That's a great question, and it's a question that I've had with some of the people here in the mainstream media that cover the San Antonio Spurs. And what the consensus is, is that Derek White will have his job back. But he's going to be eased into that, you know, starting role again. With the absence of DeJounte Murray out for the rest of the season, uh, Derek White is going to have to kind of just be, you know, coached into this uh, starting point guard role again. Bryn Forbes is filling in nicely, but let's be honest. We've seen Bryn Forbes out there on the defensive end, and it's kind of lacking. But he's doing the best he can because he's only, I believe, six foot two, and he's guarding, you know, guards that are, you know, maybe six four or six six, you know, so... He's got his work cut out for him, but he's been filling in nicely, putting up solid numbers, running the point very well. And, you know, until we get a Derek White back. But once Derek White comes back, I think he's going to have this overall, like, different presence, this different feel out there with not only him as a player, but what he's going to be able to contribute to the team as a whole as well. Because in the postseason, not in the post, I'm sorry, in the preseason, Derek White was playing very good as as far as being a point guard. Sometimes in the preseason, he was outshining DeJounte Murray. But, you know, DeJounte Murray is the go-to. But it's going to be interesting to see what's going to happen once Derek White is reinserted into this point guard position. And not only that, but there's only so many minutes to go around. So (laughs) somebody's going to get the short end of that stick, and you have uh, another point guard that we haven't talked about yet, and Lonnie Walker, you know, he's not going to be playing a ton of minutes because Pop doesn't really do that with rookies. But if you saw Lonnie Walker as well in the preseason play, 
he's legit. He's a very good point guard in the making. So the Spurs are guard heavy once, you know, Derek White and you get Lonnie Walker back. But yeah, man, Derek White's going to gonna shine, I think. He's going to surprise some people once he makes his return. Is his role going to be as as facilitator? Because while he's been out, we've, we've been seeing more uh, DeMar DeRozan facilitator, Rudy Gay facilitator, Pau Gasol facilitator. I, I know going into the year, that was going to be a DeJounte Murray role, and so they've kind of had to move it around a little bit. Does that then fall on White, or does he kind of fall into more of a scoring role? What, what kind of a point guard do you think he'll be? I think he's going to be the facilitator. They're going to count on him to score when he has his opportunities, capitalize on your opportunities. But I don't think the scoring role is going to really fall on his shoulders. I think he's going to be more of the facilitator out there. They're going to count on him to play some defense, try to go out there and, you know, do little things like maybe get some tips, you know, try to get some rebounds, wreak havoc for the other team, you know, play your defenders. Uh, He's going to go ahead and, and have his work cut out for him, no doubt, but it's going to be more of the facilitator. He's not going to be that prolific scorer that we have in uh, DeMar DeRozan right now. That's not going to be his job, which is great for him because you don't want to have to count on your point guard to try to score, you know, a solid 20 points a night. That's going to fall under the shoulders of DeMar DeRozan, a LaMarcus Aldridge. But if you can get some points, you know, as far as double digits out of Derek White, I think the Spurs are going to have an even better offense. Last guy I want to bug you about, and this now takes us over to the big man side of the equation, and that's Jakob Pertl, who came over in the Kawhi Leonard trade. I think there was some hope that maybe he'd be playing more significant minutes by this point, but it hasn't really happened yet. How do you see his season taking shape? Is he going to get more responsibility as the year goes on? Is this just sort of what it is for now while he learns everything uh, that the Spurs do maybe differently than Toronto. He looked pretty good in Toronto last year, but he hasn't looked that comfortable yet for San Antonio this season. Yeah, he hasn't really looked comfortable with San Antonio. He started the first home game that the Spurs had or the first game of the season, and then he only played, I believe it was four minutes. Then after that, it seems like he's kind of fallen out of favor in the rotation. It's not out of favor with Coach Pop. I just think it has to do a lot with matchup, you know, and the thing with Yaka Portal, since he is young, he's still learning the Spurs system. And we've all seen, like you had mentioned, he doesn't look very comfortable right now. I think as the season will progress, we'll see him have more of a role out there. But right now it looks like the Spurs are leaning more on Paul Gasol being out there on the floor, which I would love to see Yaka Portal out there. I mean, he's young, he's athletic. To me, he's a younger version of Paul Gasol. And he actually plays better defense than Paul does right now. But again, we're just going to have to be patient. As the season progresses, he'll probably wind up getting a little bit more minutes. But we're just going to have to see what Coach Pop does at this time because you have Dante Cunningham who's playing great. They've also been inserting Quincy Pondexter into the rotation as well. And you just hope that at some juncture we're going to see more Yaka Portal because the Spurs gave up a lot to get not only DeMar DeRozan, but Jakob Portal as well. We gave up Kawhi. We gave up Danny Green. So fans want to see him play. I want to see him play. So hopefully we'll see more of that as the season progresses. Joe Garcia, thank you, my good man. Much appreciated. A little deep dive on the Spurs. It's been a real pleasure. Oh, thank you. It's always a pleasure, man. Ask me back anytime. I will definitely do that. That was going to be my next question. He is Joe Garcia. He is a Spurs analyst and the host of the Two Shots podcast. He's also co-host of the Locked On Spurs podcast. You can follow him on Twitter at Two Shots Podcast. That's all spelled out in letters. The website is Two Shots SA with the number two dot com. Joe, one more time. Thanks again. I appreciate it, man. That was excellent. More excellent stuff this time from Joe Garcia. Hey, forgot to mention the coupon code during our interview with Joe, so we'll sneak that into the show right now. As always, we give out a coupon code when we have a guest on the podcast. And this one is for, as usual, three bucks off the HoopBall in-season premium membership. The coupon code, two shots, two, the number, S-H-O-T-S. Number two, S-H-O-T-S. That's $3 off uh, the HoopBall in-season premium membership, which, by the way, Right now is a crazy awesome deal. I mentioned it on yesterday's podcast, and I'm going to do it basically every day this week. 
it has been dropped. The price that is from twenty uh, from twenty nine ninety nine to twenty four ninety nine. I can get this promo right. I'm sorry, guys. It's been a long night. <laughs> it's now twenty four ninety nine for the month of November, and for the next six days. It is $5 off, so $19.99 for the next most of a week. And if you use a coupon code, you can get it for another $3 off. That is 8 bucks off, an already ridiculously low price of $24.99. That brings it down to $16.99, $17 for November, December, January, February, March, and half of April. That's right. It's just over $3 per month to get the, the Waiver Wire show on Sunday, the lineup show on Monday, nightly interaction with the pros Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday on a live video podcast with a chat room. You get the nightly premium content. You get the DFS content. You get the projection tools. You get the scheduling grid. You get the streaming grid. The list goes on and on. It's, we, it's worth so much more, so much more than just $3 a month. Make yourself one cup of coffee at home instead of getting it at a store, and you can afford the HoopBall in-season premium membership. Again, coupon code from today's podcast is the number two, S-H-O-T-S, two shots, courtesy of Joe Garcia with the Two Shots podcast. Again, a big thanks to Joe for hopping on the show. Let's turn our attention now to what's going on tonight, which is Thankfully, kind of a small card. I know many of you are going to be uh, standing in lines today to vote. I would, I'm would, i never going to get political on this podcast. I made that promise early on. But please do go out there and vote. I'm not going to say anything about it. measures. I'm not going to say anything about sides. Just take the time today to go vote. Find the time. Somehow carve out a moment. If I can do it, you can do it. Because my schedule is nuts. Absolutely nuts. Uh, and if you can't do it, then you should have probably figured out how to do a mail-in thing. It's a really big deal, uh, and I'm probably going to tweet about it more than I am going to talk about it on the podcast. But it's a big thing today, right? I mean, we can all agree on that. Right, left, center, whatever. Voting is important. Go do it. Let me know you did it. I'll retweet that joint. Take a picture of your I Voted sticker. I'll retweet that on, uh, you know, whatever the service is that handles the Twitter stuff. Uh, I am at Dan Bespris on Twitter, by the way, for those that uh, that haven't followed me yet. But I think most of you have. And of course, please do subscribe and rate and review the podcast if you have a moment. Coming up tonight, a four-game Tuesday card. A nice light one. A little bit of a break. You know, it's funny. I, I, I love the fact that you've got six, seven, eight, nine games almost every night these days. But a little respite every once in a while is okay. And on a day like today, where I think we're all going to be watching other stuff, watching the news, whatever... Uh, it's good to get a little bit of a break. And on top of that, the games from a fantasy standpoint are not that compelling. You've got Atlanta in Charlotte, uh, and the only real news there is that Torian Prince is probably out. I don't think we have confirmation just yet. Uh, but if he's out, then that just means more falls on the other weirdos in Atlanta. And they're a cast of characters right now. A lot of Trey Young. You're going to see more Kent Bazemore. You're going to see this continued minute split at center between Alex Len and Dwayne Dedman. Uh, DeAndre Bembry is probably going to get a few more shots. I mean, they're really, they're really a, a pretty bad team, <laughs> Atlanta. Uh, but, you know, sometimes bad teams walk into games where teams don't really take them seriously. I think Charlotte's in such a spot right now where they realize how important victories are over the bad teams because they're not going to beat the really good ones very often. Uh, so I do think this one, by the way, the line on this game is Charlotte by 11 and a half. So I don't want anything to do with that, but I do think the Bob or <laughs> the Hornets is going to call them the Bobcats. Sorry, Charlotte. It, they're going to win this game. They have to win this game and they should put up some pretty good fantasy numbers. The only hope is that it remains somewhat competitive so that our Hornets can actually play the fourth quarter. Of course, those guys, I mean, Jeremy Lamb, Kemba Walker and Nick Batum, and at this point, everything else is a timeshare, and for that reason, I just I can't bring myself to trust those other things, that timeshare. It's just it's a bad situation. Washington is in Dallas. Wizards are a one-point road favorite. Luka Doncic is uh, considered uh, a possible play in this ballgame, which I think we're hoping that he'll go. Let me see if we have any additional information. Yeah, he's in. He's in, and Torian Prince is officially out. So we do have those little pieces of information on, on today's card, and it's what we expected. Mavericks played 
competitively in most of their games. And that's basically what Tyler was saying on yesterday's podcast. If you haven't had a chance to listen to that, please do go back and check out our show with Tyler Watts from The Smoking Cuban. They've been competitive in basically every game, but they can't get over the hump. And I don't know if it's because they don't want to, but it does seem like they wanted to try this year. So in my estimation, this is a Mavericks team that's just trying to figure it out. And with young guys like Doncic uh, and Dennis Smith Jr., who you guys all know, I believe, to not simply be all that good at basketball, uh, they're struggling to do so. Harrison Barnes is being worked back into the mix. For that reason, I'm paying a little bit of attention to where his shots come from. And the expectation is that a lot of them would come from Wesley Matthews, and a lot of them have so far come from Wesley Matthews. So he's going to start to see a slightly more diminished role than the guy that was scoring 20 points a game. So let's keep a close watch on Matthews. He's still going to be out there for long stretches, but it's possible that his shot count drops. And if that happens, if he's not volume-blasting three-pointers in, then he starts to become a little bit of a liability. So he's kind of teetering right now, more than you might think for a guy who's owned in more than 60% of Yahoo leagues because of his hot start. And he's a guy that we like as kind of an old man that can just plod along. We need more steals. We need more efficiency. And I don't know that we're going to get either of those from Matthews this year. He's still taking 14 shots a game, so it's no reason to panic just yet. He's still hitting almost three three three-pointers a game, which is still a pretty good number. He's a good foul shooter. Uh, But steals are down this year. That's going to need to get up from 0.8 to 1.2 if we really want to get to a good spot with him. Uh, The rebounds are not going to come back into the threes. I I mean, maybe they'd touch them, but with DeAndre Jordan in town, there's just a guy that that gobbles up rebounds. It does have a kind of a trickle-down impact on the rest of the team. And so just keep a close watch on him because he's the kind of guy that can tail off with a low shooting percentage at a medium to high volume, that'll crush you if he's not doing enough other stuff. So we're watching him not that closely. We're not at that point yet, but that point is not that far away. It is around the corner if things don't kind of steer back in the right direction. Now, Washington, a team that hasn't played a lot of great defense so far this year, so a chance maybe for Matthews to get some open looks in this game. Wizards did play better in their last one. In an insane twist, Dwight Howard has actually made them less dysfunctional. I know. It's this weird, nebulous universe we live in now where if you take a functional team and put Dwight Howard on it, he will create dysfunction. If you take a team that's literally as dysfunctional as you can possibly get, there's almost nothing you could do to make it worse. And so here we have the Dwight effect. So the Wizards got off to this terrible start this season, right? And we've talked about how the underwager looked wonderful right out of the shoot. They were 1-7 in seven before finally winning their last ball game. They're still not a good team, but they're not going to go one out of every eight ball games. They're not that bad. They still have John Wall, Bradley Beal, Otto Porter, Markeith Morris. I mean, there's still enough guys on that team where they should be able to find a way to beat some of the poor to middling teams in the NBA. So expect the Wizards to go on a little bit of a winning streak soon. Again, much as we like to fade Dwight Howard teams uh, and the Wizards for being terrible so far, we're hitting a point now where the value is actually starting to swing a little bit back in their direction. Uh, And I think this is a game coming off a victory in their last one. The Wizards will be competitive. So uh, ever so slightly into the Washington side, not sure if it's enough to make a play on it because they could fall apart at any moment. But uh, I do think they're sort of, I don't want to say do necessarily, but a bad team, a team playing poorly that gets a win, that can alleviate some of the pressures, and then they can often go on to win a couple in a row. Brooklyn by a point and a half in Phoenix. Phoenix actually has been playing a tiny bit better over their last eh, one to two bog. I mean... Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to go so I'm going to go 1 to 2 games and a lot of it is Devin Booker. They lost by 9 to the Raptors, which is no small thing, and then they beat the Grizzlies in their last ball game. So, they're going to be ready to go. Uh, of course, Brooklyn is also a team playing better than a lot of people expected. We did have the over 30 something. The top of my head was a 31 for the season, which I think a lot of people thought was a crazy wager, but they're actually not that bad, guys. 
Are we seeing the same things? Yeah, Nets are four and six. They're well on their way to actually getting to that number. This is going to be a competitive game. Uh, I think you're going to see it swing back and forth a little bit. You'll probably see the Nets go out by eight or nine points. Then Phoenix will make a little bit of a run. They're getting better play from Trevor Ariza. Booker being back allows that situation to develop. And Ariza can get better looks. DeAndre Ayton, he looks decent so far this year. Uh, they're just... They also hit kind of a bottoming out point, and so for that reason, I do have a slight lean to the Phoenix side, but I also think this is going to be a pretty good ball game. Portland-Milwaukee, this is basically a pick em. I have Milwaukee by a point. A lot of really tight games today. Uh, I'm not going to mess around with this ball game. Bucks are coming off uh, of a 30, is it 35? 35 point win over the Kings after losing on the road to the Celtics. So this is kind of your weird in-between. They play the Warriors two days from now in Golden State. So there's a ever so slight possibility of a look ahead in this game, but I don't know that I'd chalk it up to that. For that reason, ever so slight lean to the Blazers side, but there's a chance the Bucks just sort of overwhelm them. They have so much talent, and as good as the Blazers have been defensively, you just sort of can't stop Giannis for an entire basketball game. So uh, a lot of these close ball games, if I had to, this is like gun to head kind of thing. I hate that expression, but we used it. Uh, I would say uh, slight leans to Washington, Phoenix, and Portland. But again, this is just like, hey, Dan, what do you, if you had to say what was going to happen, who do you think is going to win these three games? And that's the way I lean in those ones. From a fantasy perspective, not really paying much attention to those uh, late two games. Uh, now Daylight Savings Phoenix is is getting started a little bit before the West Coast teams there. They shift into mountain time for the next three months. Uh, there's just no real angles at play. You know, I could maybe make the argument that Rondé Hollis Jefferson playing more in Brooklyn. How does that impact the other bodies out there? You could make the argument in Phoenix... What is What happens if T.J. Warren plays? We still don't know. If he plays, I would assume that ruins the night for Bridges. But if he plays, how much does he play? So that's something I guess you could convince yourself you're keeping an eye on. And then Milwaukee-Portland, I think the only thing I'm really watching is Zach Collins, that 70% shooting number for the year, starting to come back to earth a little bit. He's still at 58%. But his top 50 clip is now more of a top 100 clip. A lot of his value was tied up in the fact that he was making almost every shot he took. And now he's at four games in a row at 50% or less after shooting 70% for two weeks. Uh, He's only had four blocks over those last four games. It's just life is hard, guys, when you're averaging just 19 to 20 minutes a game. You have to be able to do so much in such a limited amount of time and there are a couple of guys in the NBA that can pull that off. Jonas Valanciunas is one, but that's because when he's on the floor, he becomes a focal point. They want to work through him. He gets an opportunity to do damage because he's going to get all the rebounds, and on offense, they're going to make sure they they work it through. I mean, he's averaging 19 minutes a game, and he's a top 50 fantasy play. And I know a lot of people are like, Golly, man, if he could play 26 minutes, yeah, but also his stuff wouldn't be the same. I think for Valanchunas, what we really should want is for him to get up to 21 or 22, two or three more minutes. He could maintain his foot firmly on the accelerator, but if you have him playing more than that, then his play starts to taper off. He can't go full bore for the 25, 26, 27 minutes that everybody wanted him to. They found a really nice thing with Valanchunas of him giving maximum effort for 19 minutes, but I want max effort for 21 minutes, just like 10% more, and then we're really cooking. But right now, we're already kind of cooking. The other guys that are kind of in that mix, uh, Demonis Sabonis is doing it in 23 and a half minutes. Dwayne Dedman has been doing it in 19, but for me, his number is a little bit less sustainable. He hasn't missed a free throw yet this year. He's blocking almost two shots a game in 19 minutes. That type of stuff is likely not going to hold. And then there's just sort of nobody else. Then you got to go way down the list until you get to basically Zach Collins, who's at 20 minutes, and he's just inside the top 100. you got to be able to play to make an impact. Fairly straightforward, I guess, but worth going into 
some small degree. Uh, that'll about do it for this Tuesday show. Tomorrow, we'll have the great, the Miracle Man. The Miracle Man is back. Vince Miracle will be doing a mailbag show. So get those questions in on Twitter to myself, at Dan Bespris, or at VM Center. That's Vince's Twitter handle. We'll be answering some of the top questions on tomorrow's, that's Wednesday's show, here on Fantasy NBA Today. Thursday, we will have another new guest on the podcast. This is exciting. I love it. Uh, and I could just flip a coin, honestly, but it's likely going to be a man named Ben Vasconcellos from the Wiz of Oz, Washington Wizards team. We can do a little bit of a deep dive on that. And of course, we'll have the live show on Friday with Brew. That'll wrap up the week. I don't know why I'm getting so far ahead of myself. It's only Tuesday. Good luck, everybody. Whatever you're rooting for tonight on the voting side, uh, do it. Go vote and watch the news and see what happens. Uh, what it, Be the change. Is that the thing? I don't know. I, I'm not much for expressions, but you should vote. You can tell him Dan sent you. Have a great day, everybody. Enjoy the short Wednesday, uh, Tuesday card, and we'll talk to you tomorrow morning. This has been a Hoop Bowl presentation.